Well, hello, Kepler family, and welcome to another Kepler Conversations. I'm here today with humanities teacher, Lily Wilmoth. Welcome, Lily. Thank you for having me, glad to be here. So before we get down to business, I have to ask about that piece of art behind you. Oh, <laughs> that. <laughs> Mog seems to be looming over your shoulder. What is that? Oh, this is actually something I made in college. Uh, I was an RA and halls that we had had to have a theme. And every year, of course, I had super nerdy hallways in mind. One year was themed for The Hobbit. And so I made, let me see if I can move this. Oh, there, yeah. you can see, and there's Bilbo right it there. Woven armor and everything. Yeah, and so I kept it because I thought I actually did really well on that. And uh, it's now downstairs in our schoolroom area. So, <laughs> nice. yeah. Well, as as the husband of one of Kepler's art teachers, uh, the little plug in the I worked at a plug for my wife's classes. I must admire that. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so you're teaching uh, two courses this coming fall, an integrated humanities course for, we'll say, junior high, and we can unpack that a little later, and then also how to write a fairy tale. Uh, before we get into those those classes, I'd love to just talk a little bit about your teaching background, your teaching philosophy. Um, and in particular, a line in your, so if you go to the Kepler website, you can see the teacher's statement of faith, some of their history, uh, their teaching philosophy. And in your teaching philosophy, you, you mention um, that your, your pedagogy is centered in a restful atmosphere and spurred on by wonder. Uh, could you talk about restful atmosphere, talk about wonder in particular? And I just want to put this out here in front of you to let you deal with. Um, are people going to do work and do good work if you're talking about rest and wonder? Oh, that's that's a good question. Many good questions. Well, I definitely would encourage you to talk to a couple students who have taken my class because I think that they would probably be able to explain it pretty well. Okay. Um, uh, I think having been raised in a classical Christian school myself, uh, I think I saw things I didn't like and things that I did like growing up. And so I think I've taken a lot of the personal experience that I had and ran with it and my own teaching methods, uh, trying to improve upon the things that could be improved upon. So I think that's kind of what my goal is. Um, but also with the online learning kind of side of things, it's very different than how I would be in a, cl in a classroom in some ways, I think. Um, the online environment does lend it more to uh, students taking on a lot more responsibility on their own. And there's a lot more parent involvement, I think, in this environment online versus in the classroom, which I actually really like. I think that that helps a lot with a lot of the pressures of the classroom not being a teacher um, in this environment. But when, okay, talking about pedagogy, talking about teaching from rest, learning from a state of rest and leisure in the classroom. Um, so growing up, I grew up in a ACCS school, classical Christian, like pretty hardcore, intense, uh, strong academic school. Um, and I went to ACCS conferences fairly frequently as a kid because my mom is a teacher also mm. in classical Christian school. So I, I had a lot of that around me all the time, her talking about the books, about the people she met. And there was so much that was inspiring and wonderful about it. But at the same time, there was this very kind of almost impossible to reach goal a lot of the time for the students where they wanted you to read a stack of books this high and have good things to say about all of them and do that in five different classes and have time to do other things outside of school and somehow enjoy it all in the process. It's just impossible. You can't do that. It's impossible. And especially I am not a fast reader. So mm. for me, it was hard because I felt like I would take maybe one book out of the five I was reading at a time and actually yeah. spend time on it. And the rest of it, I felt like I was rushing through, uh, trying to complete assignments for the book and well, yeah, not really thinking about the book. It's interesting so. that you say that because uh, I, I had a college experience, right? I went to a, a, a college that had some ACCS connections and its origins. And the very first thing we did was learn how to speed read. Right. And then they threw city of God at us and gave us a very short time to read it. And, you know, as a young man, I was quite proud of, of the fact that, you know, I had done this. Um, but 
you know, as I've gotten a little older and become a teacher myself, um, I, well, that that's just actually seemed a little crazy at the time. And then lo and behold, I discovered that that same school a few years later kind of quietly kind of put that off to the side, you know, like maybe this isn't the best, the best way. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, I, I think there is maybe in, in the, cl in classical circles, a, a growing prioritizing uh, of scole and of, of leisure. Mm -hmm. And of course people debate about what exactly that might mean. Um, but I'm certainly a fan. And I know, you know, Kepler, we having, you know, this flipped classroom, we're definitely behind the idea that that a restful atmosphere encourages learning. And actually, so, I mean, I, I obviously, I asked you this question knowing about you and um, knowing about your classes and, and uh, my office oversees along with student council, the publishing of our student magazine. And I've got to say that your students in your How to Write a Fairy Tale class for last year were some of the most prolific in submitting and they submitted good work. You know, that told me two things. First of all, they're learning how to write and write well, and they're having fun with it. Second of all, they're confident in what they're doing, right? There's a reason that the people in this class feel like what they're making is, is, is worth putting out there and seeing how people will engage with it. Uh, so I was, very, I was very impressed by that. And so, hey, you know what? Maybe wonder can produce results. <laughs> maybe, maybe, you never know. And I'm so glad to hear that because I think that's what I was hoping to accomplish. And of course, part of it is they were great students in that class, which is wonderful. It was a wonderful class to teach. Um, but I think part of it too is uh, I don't teach in the way that I'm, I'm at the top and I have to tell them all this stuff and they have to listen to me and they have to take notes. That's not really how I want to teach because I feel like the works that we're reading are really what are speaking. It's not about me. I don't feel like I'm I'm that important or special. I think it's more about these works of literature that I've chosen for us to read and I've put them together in a certain way, um, having us read them in a certain way and asking specific questions. And the questions I ask the student are never what kind of questions or what or how, how did this happen? Why did this happen? What color shirt was the main character wearing? That's not the kinds of questions I want them to be answering. I want them to answer the why questions and the how questions and the application questions. So when we were reading through fairy tales in that class, or when we were reading through works of fiction in that class, uh, I made sure that the questions that I was asking were very specific and required them to actually delve in and think about it and make this their own and actually take ownership of the work uh, mm. and to become interested in the work. Uh, so that's kind of, I think, the way I teach, essentially, is I want to teach in a way that stirs up their minds to get moving uh, and to be inspired to learn on their own. Because it's not about Lily Wilmoth and how great I am, you know. Uh, I think it's much better to teach in a way that inspires them to think mm. and to uh, explain what they've learned to me. Uh, and then they talk about it together in class and they come up with even better ideas. Uh, and then when they actually get down to the business of writing and in that, on that class, you know, writing their own um, stories, their own fairy tales, we came up with some really excellent stuff because of all of the workshopping that they were able to do in the application and putting together different writers' opinions about what a fairy tale is and different uh, writers' stories and looking back on history, the history of fairy tales and seeing all the different kinds of fairy tales that have been created and, and kind of, um, we described it as a melting pot of fairy tales. So I guess that's how Tolkien described it, is how there's a lot of fairy tales that are similar to one another, a lot of similar elements, but very different stories. And so it's kind of like a melting pot that you pull things from. Every bite is different. Um, and you can go and make your own stories using those same elements and still get really beautiful, fantastic stories, even using similar motifs or similar mm -hmm. themes. Uh, so I think that they learned a lot about how to incorporate those things. Well, I thought your students did, did great work and, and took responsibility for their work. And, and that kind of touches a comment you made earlier that um, that piqued uh, my interest for sure. And that you made the comment about you know teaching online and, and on the online environment being one in which students need to take a little more responsibility. You know, there are several things about the Kepler experience, uh, you know, the flipped classroom, right? So the, the, the lecture is pre-recorded or, or done apart. You know, the time together is supposed to be 
recitation, dialogue, interaction, conversation. Um, in, in a lot of ways, it's like being in college, right? Where the, the, the student really has to, they, you know, they're not going to have their, their hand held. The teachers are there. The teachers are available. They're office hours or whatever. But the, the student has to take responsibility. And, and it's been interesting over this year uh, to see how, how students from different backgrounds might struggle with a little bit of culture shock with that. You know, whether the, you know, they're coming from government schools or whether they, they had been homeschooled. And of course, you know, some students are on our diploma track and doing everything through us. But most families is, you know, a class here or there. Different experiences, different backgrounds. But, you know, you do see occasionally, like you can just tell that it's, it's just culture shock, that they're not used to um, not being told what to do and where to be all of the time that they, they have to kind of take some of that on themselves. So all of that to ask, do you have anything from this past year that really like that, that kind of struck you that way and in observing how students took on responsibility for themselves? Hmm. I think overall, my students did pretty well. I think that they had, I think they had a tough job in the sense that this was a new platform and kind of a new space, new teachers. Yes. Um, and so in the beginning, there was a, definitely a learning curve for them on how things work, uh, how to work this new classroom and everything. There was a big learning curve for me. I must say that. <laughs> so they were patient with me a lot too. When I was like, where is everybody? I'm on the Zoom call. Uh, and then um, somehow I'm on two accounts at the same time, like crazy <laughs> things were going on. And, and then I was talking out of two accounts and it sounded like an alien. And then there was like loud zinging and my being, beeping in my ear, you know, that kind of thing. It's uh -huh. kind of crazy, weird, yeah. technological things like that. Yeah, but honestly, I think uh, overall the students did fantastically because they're raised in this generation that's very dependent on technology. In some ways it's good, some ways it's not so good. But when it comes to this sort of thing, but doing school online, they feel very confident pretty quickly. A lot yeah. of the time they jump right in to the platform and they look all around, they find where everything is. Like, okay, I think I got this. And I think most of the time they, they, they did a very good job of getting everything in uh, on time and doing all the That's things great. properly. So <laughs> good, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I know that we certainly, you know, just we're really happy with how the year went and how, how the students and, and families interacted with all the teachers. Uh, so we have these integrated humanities classes at Kepler, right? So these these classes that count for three credits: uh, a credit of history, a credit of literature, a credit of philosophy, uh, and you're offering an integrated humanities course for seventh and eighth graders, uh, early moderns, James the first, George the third. Uh, I'd love to hear about this course. It's a good course. I've taught sure. this a few times. Um, <laughs> it's a good course. I've taught this a few times. Um, I've taught this with seventh grade in the classroom for a couple of years, a little while ago, before my kids were all born. Um, but it's a wonderful class from this Western perspective. So it's about West. It's kind of like that Western civilization type spin on things, similar to how Omnibus approaches stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But just a little bit of a different way of going about things than you would in an Omnibus class. Uh, I've kind of, I should say, created the shell of it around um, the story of the world type thing. So not exactly using her book per se. I feel like she doesn't give enough detail and gives a really broad array of stuff. So ours is a bit more focused in than that, but that's kind of the general idea of how things are approached. Uh, and so in this class, because it's, it's geared more toward logic stage students, we deal with a lot of application. We deal a lot with compare contrast. Um, we deal a lot with um, outlining pages in the encyclopedia and then discussing what's happening in that piece of history. Uh, and then we read primary resources from that piece of history. Um, and then as we go about the year, we're able to compare different pieces of history to each other. We're comparing different people groups to each other. Um, for example, um, there's a section of the class where we're discussing the conquests of the new world. Um, there's a segment on piracy, and there's a segment on how the Spanish went off to Central America and South America in search of gold. 
um, these explorers exploring the new world and, and getting us all over there and colonizing and kind of uh, the theme of greed is what we focus on there. Uh, there's a huge theme of greed just in this Western culture during that time period. And we talk about how these different people groups struggled with greed with their specific place that they were going. Um, we also are reading literature at the same time as we're going through the history. So um, during this portion talking about conquest, we're reading Treasure Island, which is actually mm. a really good fictional work to talk about uh, that also touches on greed and the human condition. Yes. Uh, so that's just kind of an example of one phase of our course, but it's it's got four main parts. So that's the second part that we deal with. Um, it does obviously go through the French Revolution as well and up into the American Revolution. Uh, so the last part of the year is where we really talk about the revolutions. We get into the primary documents from uh, the American Revolution and from mm -hmm. the French Revolution, compare and contrast what's going on idea-wise, theology-wise, philosophy-wise between those two nations. Um, so it gives the kids something really tangible to grasp onto in each of these eras of history um, and framing things in a way that they can see God in them um, and see um, where people are falling short of God's word, um, where sinners are sinning and where mm -hmm. there are believers leading the way ahead. So it's a, it's a nice uh, way to frame a class. It's history, it's literature, it's philosophy and theology. Uh, so there's a lot going on, but it's done in a way that's not too overwhelming so that they feel like they've learned a lot, but they are able to hold on to it. So they're yeah. not gonna just completely lose all the details once the semester is over, once the year is over. Well, I think you know, when you integrate, that actually really helps to, for, you know, to hold on. Right? When you're reading Treasure Island or, or Johnny Tremaine, and then you're also reading uh, you know, hit actual histories and mixing that in with you know, letters written by this or that thinker, uh, this is a great way to hold on to everything. But I'm, I'm looking at the texts uh, that you have here, and, and I have to ask about, it, it looks like a, a project that, I don't know if you've designed or if it's somebody else's, the story of Blackbeard, Queen Anne's Revenge Project. So is that a project that the kids do? Or is that the project that Queen Anne exacted for revenge? Oh, that's a reading material from, okay. Um, okay. It's hard to find reading about pirates, but I look for primary resources. <laughs> so um, there's a couple of them that I selected um, from historical websites or from like museums. And so I think that's one of those okay. is they, uh, yeah, they go on there and they read about the story of Blackbeard. And there's like a really cool historical um, actual article written about him. It's well, I'll funny. tell you, the 13 year old boy in me reads that and gets very excited. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, it's yeah. quite fun. Those pirate um, articles are nuts. Like I have a few different stories. A lot of them were like newspaper articles from back in the 17 or 1800s. Mm -hmm. They're crazy. There's a lot of crazy stuff that was going down <laughs> back in <Yeah>. the day. <laughs> well, and you have a class for upperclassmen as well for 10th through 12th graders, how to write a fairy tale. We talked a little bit about you know about last year and, and that class, a, a very popular course. It is right now in, in special access, which means that uh, families should express interest. And once we have enough families that are excited about the course, which they should be, because it was a great class this past year, then, then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up and green light it. I'd love to see you teach this class again. Can you tell us a bit about, about this course? Sure, sure, sure. So in this course, we read a lot of different kinds of books. If you take a look at the reading list, it is pretty broad and you're probably wondering what in the world, how do we do all of this and learn about fairy tales? Well, <laughs> I think the wonderful thing about the class is we start out with Tolkien. He wrote a whole fantastic essay on what a fairy tale is and what it is not. And that's where we start. That's our ground zero. Um, then we take what we've learned from there and read fairy tales. We just start reading fairy tales. Uh, we have a few different classic authors that I've chosen for this specific class. There's lots of other great fairy tale authors, but we can't do everything. And so in the spirit of that learning from leisure kind of perspective, I've chosen a few things for us to look at. So then we have the students read a few fairy tales from each different author and we talk about them. So I assign reading questions 
And usually they have to answer the same questions for each story that they read. And then we come together in class and discuss what you answered on those questions. And all of them are why questions, how questions, how does this compare here? Why do you think the author did this? How does this um, make it a real fairy tale? Is this a real fairy tale? Why is it not a real fairy tale? Um, what would Tolkien say about this? So those are kind of some examples of the sorts of questions you might see. Um, lots of different kinds of authors. Uh, for example, Oscar Wilde, his writing is very different than something like a Charles Perrault or uh, and Hans Christian Andersen, very different types of writing, very different flavors to their stories. Uh, so as we jump into the class, that's those are the things we're looking at, getting a feel for what a fairy tale is, what it is not. At that point, we start thinking about how could I create one of these? Uh, so we start taking what we've learned and putting the pieces together. Um, later on in the year, they make their own fairy tale, and that's a big assignment, whole ordeal. Um, they also do a satire of a fairy tale, which I think is a fantastic exercise um, in really learning what something is because you're trying to create a kind of a parody of something. So you can't know yes. what something is unless you've really, or you can't really do a parody unless you know really what it is because you're making a joke off of it, essentially. So we got some really good ones going last year. And the latter half of the year, after we've finished one fairy tale, we branch out a little bit from just the pure fairy tale genre. And we look at fiction and we try to find pieces of the fairy realm in fiction. Uh, so they read through these books and they talk about what in this qualifies as fairy or the fairy realm and what doesn't. And so a lot of it actually comes back down to um, the incarnation it comes down to um, where Christ is visible in these stories. And if you've read Norms and Nobility by David Hicks, like the ideal type is kind of an idea that we talk a lot about. This idea that there's this overarching sense of goodness, truth, beauty uh, in the story somewhere. And if you find these little pieces of that throughout the story, what that means and how that gives it a sort of a fairy nudge or nudge yeah. towards fairy tale. Um, so at the latter end of the year, we're talking almost about how a fairy tale is different from fiction, how they're similar to fiction. Um, and one of the last books that we look at is Fahrenheit 451, which is an interesting choice maybe, uh, but it's a perfect example of a fictional narrative that almost 100% fits the line of a fairy tale, even though it's a work of fiction by an author who's an atheist. So very interesting stuff. Uh, but the students learn a lot through all of the reading that they're doing. And it's something they have to take ownership of themselves and to really spend the time on it, think about it on their own and come to class with some great ideas to share. And it's kind of like a positive peer pressure environment because everyone comes to class and they're like, I really wanna have something good to say when we get to this question. And so <laughs> you can tell that there were times when the student was like, gosh, I really messed that up. And they were just kind of embarrassed about it and just trying to encourage them like, you know what, it's okay, you did great. <laughs> Let's yeah. keep moving on. Yeah. Well, as both a teacher and an athletics coach, I, I'm a big believer in the old positive peer pressure. And it's something that, you know, we, we've actually had a lot a lot of, of family. We are a platform for homeschoolers. And as, as your teens begin to grow into themselves, that's really an element for both boys and girls uh, that, you know, it can be an important part of that educational experience is just you know, seeing what other people are doing and, you know, seeing what that standard might be and how you might be able to surpass it. And it, it's it's really valuable to be able to see what other people are doing when given the same parameters that you are. Well, thanks. That's nice to yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, not just you, but, you know, any, any, any other teacher. Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. You definitely do that, Lily Wilma. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, both these courses, Early Moderns for 7th and 8th graders, and then How to Write a Fairy Tale. And How to Write a Fairy Tale is, is both a literature course and a creative writing. You know, sort of, you, you get all of that, both year-round courses. Uh, so I encourage families to check that out on our website. Uh, below this video, we'll have the link to, uh, to Lily's uh, profile, and the classes will be on there. So I encourage you guys to check that out. Lily, thanks so much for stopping by.
Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. So long.